that. So I was here, uh, I don't know, three, four years ago. Uh, and I saw kind of this community building, which I thought was really cool. And I think this was one of the last slides I showed you last time. And I said, you know, hopefully you can maintain this over the long haul because I think these kinds of organizations are going to be really important. And so the good news is I'm back three or four years later and there still looks like there's a really strong group here. And uh, I think that's really good, speaks volumes for what you're doing and really important. So you guys are playing the great human experiment. So we're talking about chemicals. You got to know going into this, if you're worried about sprays and things like that, you're got other issues, right? We're constantly being bombarded by chemicals in all kinds of ways. You know, you guys seen Dark Waters? Anybody seen that movie? Nobody? Anybody? Yeah, well, so, you know, microwave popcorn bags are lined with, you know, have a chemical called PFOS, if you heard of this, or PFOA. Uh, incredibly toxic stuff, and especially then when you heat up the bag and it leaches into your popcorn. The butterier flavoring is even toxic. It's called diacetyl, and especially for your lungs. And this guy must have eaten a lot of popcorn, but he won a multi-million dollar lawsuit because he developed what's called his popcorn lung. And it's from inhaling so much of this artificial butter that they put on the popcorn. Um, but there's the PFOAs, there's the diacetyl. Your canned goods are lined with bisphenol, not to mention the tuna, you know, has methyl mercury in it. Red lipstick, I don't get it, but for a while there it had lead in red lipstick. I don't know why red. Why, you know, I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm a cosmetic company. It's, let's put a little uh, lead in the red lipstick. I don't, I'm, you know, it seems crazy to me. Arsenic in rice, right? So um, that's a problem, especially if you make rice, you eat a lot of rice, which some people do. Um, coal fire plants every way you can imagine. And then of course the Portland. So take home message, right? Lots of exposure already in our everyday lives, let alone what might be going on around here. What is that picture? Yeah, remember the glass company and the metals? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, bullseye. Yeah. So um, I'm going to do everything in my power to just keep this interesting. So I'm not going to bore you. But some basic things you should understand about exposure. So that's why I call it like toxicology 101. Of course, you know the first saying, our basic paradigm is the dose determines toxicity. Everything's toxic, right? Everything. It's just a matter of giving you enough of it. It'll kill you, including water. The crazy radio programs where, you know, they tell somebody to drink, you know, two, three, four gallons of water and you can't pee and they die. So everything's toxic. Okay, it's the first thing. The other thing is if we expose this room, you know, everybody in this room to something, we're all going to respond slightly different to it. We're genetically different, we're different males and females, we have, we're taking different drugs, some of us drink, some of us don't, whatever, makes us all different. But when we do that and we look at the response, so maybe I put a gas in here and I see when people are gonna pass out, for example. So when we start to put a low concentration of the gas, we're gonna see some people are just gonna go like that. Those are the really sensitive people that you always see in a population. And I even see it in a population of fish when we're testing fish. There's always those first few fish, man, you just stare at them funny and they die, right? <laughs> then as you continue to increase the concentration, you get an area, whoops, there we go. You get an area where most everybody in the room is going to respond. All right, it's kind of the middle here, and that's why that's one of the parameters that we use to compare the toxicity of things to, to one another. It's called an LC50, you've heard this term, it's the lethal concentration that will kill 50% of the population. The reason we use that is it's statistically sound, right, because this is where most people respond, and that's why they use that. So the lower this number is, right, the more toxic something is. As we continue to increase the concentration, then you even get some that just takes forever to kill that individual or to see that response. They're really tolerant. Again, I've run bioassays out at Oregon State where we're looking at rainbow trout. 
And there's always these two, man, they just don't go. Everybody else in the aquarium has gone, long gone, and they just hang in there somehow. So, you know, if you think you're crazy and there's been some spraying and I don't feel too good, and is it just, well, it's just you and you're crazy? No, maybe not. You know, there's, there's differences in sensitivities and there's lots of reasons for that. So you shouldn't be thinking that um, one thing. When we look at toxicity, the easy one to look at is the immediate effects. And the thing we usually measure the most when we look at an acute effect to a chemical or how we test that chemical is death. That's why we say LC or LD50, concentration or dose that kills 50% of the population. The chronic effects aren't so easy to look at. First of all, it's expensive, takes a lot of time, and you gotta be looking for the right thing. If you're not looking for it, you're not gonna find it. When we talk about chronic effects, of course, the easy one is like cancer. But there's many other things that can happen. But if you're not looking for it, you're not gonna find it. If you're not testing for it, you're not gonna find it, okay? So those are the things you should know. So are you looking at the right thing? The other thing is you're never exposed to a single chemical. And that would be the case here. So I always like to use the Agent Orange example where it was a combination of two herbicides, 245T, 2,4-D, and you know, where you're seeing effects that the literature didn't say that these chemicals should cause these birth defects and cancers that we were seeing in some of our troops you know, in, in Vietnam when they were sprayed. What happened is when they manufactured these two chemicals, there was a byproduct that they didn't know about. It's called dioxin, incredibly potent carcinogen significantly influences human health, and that was what was causing the problem they finally figured out more than anything. So again, the take home message here is, first of all, we got these two, that complicates things enough, and then there's the third we didn't even know about. Um, and again, if, if you're not looking for it, you're not gonna find it. So you're exposed to mixtures, which makes things complicated. More examples. Another kind of insecticide, pyrethroids, they add a chemical called piperonal butoxide, it's a carcinogen. So if you're worried about the pyrethroid, well then you also have this additive, and then you know, it gets even more complicated. What do they do in conjunction with one another, um, for example? And then, um, you know, right here, chronic, Tests on pesticides may not reflect relevant environmental exposures if only one ingredient of these mixtures is tested alone. So in other words, these herbicides, when they test them, like glyphosate, which we've all heard of, they test glyphosate, just glyphosate. But when you buy, you don't buy glyphosate, you buy Roundup. Roundup has got all kinds of things, including the interesting thing called inert, meaning shouldn't hurt anybody, <coughs> ingredients. So what they're finding with things like Roundup is Roundup is actually fairly toxic. Glyphosate by itself, not as much as when you put the whole package together. So again, it's this mixture thing that complicates things. Um, and then similar things again with Roundup. The study, same thing, that you know, um, Roundup is more efficient than its active ingredient, glyphosate, suggesting a synergistic effect provoked by the adjuvants present in Roundup. So, yes? Dr. Gunnarsson, you may be getting to this. But Wait a minute. Stop. Okay. <laughs> well, we're out there, so, okay. Um, it was surprising to me when I was looking at uh, what they call Easy Fire. Uh, Western Helicopter does a lot of spraying in this area, market something that is jelly gasoline. Um, uh, it's, a, it's an aluminum soap that jellies the gasoline. It's the exact same thing as napalm, it's just under a different name. And I thought, well, how are we testing for this stuff if it were in our water and not used that often? I was surprised that none of this stuff is tested for in our water. The, the glyphosate the combination of chemicals, and you were just saying, if you're not looking specifically for it, you're not gonna find it. So are those of us on the coast where our water is coming off of these hills, drinking stuff that because nobody's looked for it, we're, we're the filter? You could be, yeah, you could be. Okay. 
Absolutely, yeah. Um, if you're not testing for it, not, you'll see what I mean here in a second. I'll, I'll tell you why that statement is true. Um, make it, I think I'll make it pretty um, clear. You know, so the same thing uh, that I was talking about. Um, here's, I just, I just read this, so recent publication where they looked at these different mixtures of Roundup and other, other related products. And then not only, again, were they finding the mixture being more toxic, but they were finding other things like arsenic, petroleum, sort of similar to what you're talking about, and other kinds of things in there that were more concerning, again, than the glyphosate itself. Um, and again, these guys said, well, let's just see what's in this stuff. You know, and they started looking for some of these other metals. So. Um, yeah, they found chromium, arsenic, cobalt, lead, nickel, and some of the formulations. You don't look for it, you won't find it. So, yeah. Uh, do you know any um, labs in the vicinity where you can get water tested? Like for a myriad of things like this versus just taking the whatever is presented to you as a community? Can you please repeat? Yeah, so she basically wanted to know if there were any labs, you know, if you were, had some concerns about your water where you could get it tested, basically. I can yeah. capture that one. Um, there are some, I, I can send Nancy or somebody, you know, a list of them, um, but I'll, as I continue to have the talk, I'll try to give you a feel for what is feasible and what isn't as far as testing in your pocketbook goes. That's the other challenge. So I'll, I'll, if I don't get there, remind me, but I think I will. Um, so we're talking about mixtures. We're not talking about a single chemical, right? And so there's two negative responses you can have when you're exposed to mixtures of chemicals. One is what we call an additive response. And so you might imagine I have an aquarium and I got 100 fish in the aquarium and we've got chemical A at some concentration, one milligram per liter, and we run the test for, I don't know, we'll make up some time, two days. And at the end of two days, 10 fish die. So I empty out the aquarium, clean it, get a new aquarium, fill it up, put 100 more fish in there, enter another chemical B, again, one milligram per liter, run that test, and 10 fish die. Okay, empty out the aquarium, clean it, fill it back up with water, put 100 fish. Now I put one milligram per liter of A, one milligram per liter of B. We run the test, 20 die. We would call that an additive response. Makes sense, right? 10 plus 10 is 20. So that's, you know, you can kind of add things up as you're exposed to multiple chemicals. That's the lesser of two evils. The, the bad one is the synergistic response. So same experiment, 10 fish die, 10 fish die. Now we add, let's say they're different chemicals or they have a synergistic response and we run it and all 100 fish die. So anything that's greater than additive, 20-ish, would be considered a synergistic response, basically. Um, and that's you know where you, you hear that term and it's a little more concerning because the magnitude of the response is much greater than additive. But when we talk about mixtures, those are the two really basic kinds of responses you can have or some organism can have to those chemicals. Um, so, last one, chemicals. Testing for chemicals. Who does the testing? Who does the testing? Here we go. Glyphosate, genotoxic, right? So how's it, what's it doing to the DNA, basically? Chromosomes, whatever you want to call them, all right? Let's look at it, read through it. No genotoxic activity was observed in the assay performed. The data suggests that glyphosate should not pose a genetic risk to man. There you go. Okay, you see something like this and now it's really easy. Uh, where are they, where are they, where'd they go? There they are. There's the two scientists. Notice it's in blue. Nowadays, all you gotta do is click on the blue and it'll tell you a little bit about the scientists. There's the first dude. <laughs> Let's take a look at the other guy. We Click. Can't, can't, can't very well. Monsanto, basically. <laughs> and then Monsanto. So when these companies come out with these chemicals, they do their own testing. Again, if you've seen Dark Waters, that's kind of how it started. They did their own testing. And in fact, in that case, they went, oh, wow. 
this stuff's bad, um, but we won't let anybody know about it. Um, so that's the first thing to be aware of. I always use this example. If you know this guy, his name's Tyrone Hayes. He was asked by Syngenta to test an herbicide called atrazine. He does assays on frogs. And I think he looked at the frogs in a way that uh, Syngenta probably wasn't expecting. Um, but basically what he found is that one part per billion, I, I don't know how to tell you, but that's so small, it's just small. <laughs> the smallest thing you can imagine in your life, how's that? One part per billion feminized males. These are two brothers getting it on, All right? So um, Syngenta, he sent the results to them and they said, uh, do it again. So he did it again, same result. I think he had to do it a third time. They said, you, you, this is not right. And they did not want him to publish the results. And they tried, long story short, try to ruin his career. Luckily, in his case, he turned it back on them and he's become quite famous because of this work. And what he found out was that atrazine, the herbicide, there's an enzyme in our body called aromatase. So the atrazine actually makes us make more aromatase. So if you're exposed to atrazine, you have more aromatase. What does aromatase do? It breaks testosterone down into estradiol. Particularly if you're a male, it's not the greatest thing because um, you got less of this and more of this. And even if you're a female and breast cancer and stuff like that, if you're concerned, not a great thing if you're a female either, quite honestly. So that's the thing to remember. A lot of the testing, most of the testing is done by the chemical companies. How, how is that particular chemical used? Where, where is it typically? Uh, it's used a lot in corn in the Midwest. Yeah. Oh, uh, sorry. So she wanted to know where um, atrazine is used. It's used on a lot of corn in the Midwest. Um, just about all groundwater, you can find traces of atrazine in, in groundwater wells in the Midwest. Atrazine is used heavily on coastal slopes for timber. And also coastal slopes, so there you go. You're right, yeah. You can go on ferns now, and if you go to the I want to print this. You don't have to print it, but it'll give you a more detailed readout of what they're spraying, and you'll often find atrazine in the list of things that they're spraying. So here's the question that I get asked a lot because I do some testing myself, and when I hear it, though, it sort of makes me cringe, honestly. And the saying is, um, can you test my period? Can you test whatever to see if it's safe? And my first answer to that question is, well, what do you want me to test it for? Because you can't just test stuff in general. You got to have some idea what you're looking for. Got to have some idea. Um, and so, you know, how are we exposed? We're looking at food, water, air. You know, you can get exposed on the on the skin. And then, you know, so testing depends on the properties of the chemical. And the most important properties of the chemical, I can make it easy for you, is will this chemical dissolve in water or will it dissolve in olive oil better? And that kind of tells us then what we got to do as far as testing goes. That also tells you where to expect to see it in the environment, right? If it's water soluble and you spray it on a steep slope and it rains, you can expect to see that run off and get into the streams. And if you're using those streams as your water source, it could get into your water source. If it's oil or lipid soluble, it likes to glob on the sediment particles and soil particles, and it doesn't run off as easy. But a lot of times, it tends to hang around for a long time. The other thing is if it's lipid soluble, it actually enters your body a lot easier than something that's water soluble. Because we're cell membranes, basically, our whole body. So if you eat it or you drink it, it can enter your body a lot easier if it was water soluble. But that also helps us when we do the testing. So I need to know what you want to look for a little bit. And then I put quart on here. So occasionally I'll look for some stuff for people, but I tell them up front, 
I'm not an EPA lab and, and you know, we do things right, but I'm, I'm not taking this to court because, you know, in order to do the testing the way that you should that will be admissible in court requires a lot of work, a lot of detail, and a lot of money, basically. And in fact, in the Gold Beach case, one of the agencies, I think it was the Department of Agriculture, I got them when they collected samples to show that the people, you know, they basically were saying, oh, this wasn't bad. But one of the things they did, so even how you collect the samples is critical. They collected the samples, they were collecting plant samples, they put them in plastic bags. When you test for what we call like herbicides and pesticides, things that are organics, you never put them in plastic because there's stuff in the plastic that'll leach out in your sample and contaminate your sample. So I said, you guys did it wrong. So this should not even be admissible, which could happen to me if I test something for you and you decide you want to sue somebody. So that, that's important, what the lab can do. So how do we do it? Simple, you got whatever your sample is. Soil, fish, I took a plug out of your liver, whatever you like, some kind of bio water sample. And again, we say, well, what are we looking for? First of all, we have to have some idea of what we're looking for. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, let's say it's some of these herbicides you guys have been talking about. Well, what's their property? If they're water soluble, we have to treat the sample differently. You know, we might use some acids and water to pull everything that's water soluble out of here. Or if it's lipid soluble, we'll treat this more with things like solvents that'll pull everything that's fat soluble out of here. And in fact, when we do that, just to let you know, we pull everything that's fat soluble. You guys remember the marine mammals that I test? Well, what do we test? Their blubber. What's, what's their blubber? Fat. It's fat. So when I treat the blubber, I get a beaker full of the nastiest oil you've ever seen in your life. Sorry, to like if you take a whiff of it. Whew. All right, so we pull all the fat out plus anything that was in the fat, okay? When we do that, whether we have a fraction now that has fat soluble or water soluble, we're talking hundreds, probably thousands. I didn't want to shock you too much. We're talking still, there's thousands of chemicals in there and we're gonna to have to take that sample through another process to narrow it down to what we're looking for. Let's say it's chemical X and Y. So that takes another step. It's pretty complicated. Metals are a little simpler. So metals, lead, chromium, arsenic, things like that. Sometimes we can take the sample, let's say it's a fish tissue, and we can just soak it in acid and the fish tissue just dissolves. And then we just have a beaker of material and that is a little bit easier. So metals are a little bit easier. Anyway, this is basically how it works. I gotta know what I'm looking for. I'm looking for chemical X and Y. At some point I'm gonna put this chemical in an instrument. And basically I'm telling the instrument, this is chemical X and Y and this is their concentration. It goes into the instrument and it might print something out like this. Well, here's a big peak, that's chemical X. Here's a big peak, that's chemical Y. All right, now we've set the instrument up. Next one is we put our actual sample into the instrument. That's gonna look a little different. It might look like that, but we know we've got chemical X and Y. And of course the magnitude of the peak also then sort of tells us how much we have. But that's really the basics of analyzing stuff, keeping it as simple as I possibly can. So that's why we have to know. We have to do that first, and then we'll match up the peaks the second time around, so. All right, let's look at one of your chemicals. So yeah, I'm a toxicologist. Yeah, I've looked at a lot of chemicals. Do you think I've memorized every freaking chemical there is out there and what it does? No way, craziness. And I've even, Gold Beach, I did this chemical, but I had to review it. Triclopyr. It's like, oh yeah, that one I remember a little bit. Had some issues, but I decided to kind of reinvestigate it. And it took me down a rabbit hole. So that's what it looks like, you know, whatever, who cares. And this was a ag firm, um, US Department of Agriculture, I saw this was one of their slides. 
the increasing complexity of the triclopyr conversation. So they're actually doing this to people that apply this stuff. And it was a whole PowerPoint presentation that I found and how complicated it is and what you should do and what you should wear and when you use it this way. And so I was like, unbelievable. So there's the parent compound. Just for the fun of it, there's 245T, Agent Orange, there's 24D. Only difference is right there. Pretty similar. I just threw that up there because I think it's interesting. So you've got kind of an amine version of triclopyr. They call it a triethylamine salt. If you buy it, Garland 3A, Renovate. So it's got the parent compound. It's got a little, this sort of amine group. Notice the plus and the minus. That makes sense. The plus and the minus are attracted. They're kind of bound together a little bit that way. That's one version. You got a choline or a choline salt. So you got this group, again, with the positive and the negative. It's called Vaslan. Okay. Then you got a butox butoxyethyl ester, Garland 4, Pathfinder. Got this butoxy group on there. See where I'm going with this, right? It's like, okay, so now we've got these three to deal with. Why would you do that? Basically, it's how you want to get it into the plant is kind of why it's different. Do we want to go through the leaves or do we want to go up through the roots? Through the leaves tends to be more lipid soluble. Got to get through that waxy cuticle. Through the roots tends to be more water soluble, right? The roots take up water and things like that. So if you're wondering why do they do that, that's the basic answer to that question. So we'll look at this. Toxicity. Half-life is always interesting. Take home message, fairly short. But it depends which one, right? Is it the you know, lipophilic one? Is it the water-soluble one? But generally speaking, they have relatively short half-lives. And of course, it depends on the conditions, the soil, things like that. So it's a little bit complicated. Most of these, but particularly the amine version, cause permanent eye damage. And I remember I finally went back to that, and some of the people at Gold Beach had some similar kinds of uh, problems with that. It's like, oh yeah, this stuff is really nasty in the eyes. Permanent eye damage, it says, okay? Skin irritation, lung nasal irritation, and then I saw central nervous system depression. So keep that in mind. I was like, that seems kind of strange to me. I'm not sure why I found that, but keep that in mind. Um, so some evidence of damage to brain cells, really not been looked at. So do you guys understand we say endocrine disruptor? So it's playing around with your hormones. The reason that that's significant is hormones work in our bodies. They, what they do, they do really well, but they do it at incredibly low concentrations, amazingly low concentrations, which means our body are really sensitive to those hormones. So the tiniest little dab will do you. So if you've got chemicals that can kind of mimic your hormones, they can have a, a significant response. Some indication of some kind of chronic exposure, some liver dam damage, as you see a lot with these products. Cancer, well, inconclusive. We saw some tumors and some mice, but I don't know. It's not enough there to actually make People worry. Fish, it's interesting, depends on the species. If you've heard about a bluegill, bluegill are super sensitive to it. So the LC50, remember, is a low number with bluegill. And dogs are sensitive to it. Gold Beach, they lost some dogs because dogs can't metabolize it very well. They can't get rid of it. So I continued on. Here we go. Healthy forests make a world of difference. United States Department of Agriculture. The manufacturer did not reveal the identity of inert ingredients listed as surfactants and emulsifiers in garland, blah, 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 blah. So they're saying, well, we don't really know. And it's hard for us to say if this is going to be bad for you or not because we don't know about these things. So I continue to look. Garland 4, inert, inert ingredients, almost 40%. Kerosene. I was like, don't they make kerosene from crude oil? Isn't it got all kinds of nasty chemicals in it? Let's see, I remember reading about kerosene. That wasn't good stuff. If you look at kerosene, of course, it's a lot of chemicals. It's petroleum-based, right? So naphthalenes, aromatic hydrocarbons, these cause cancer, many of them. 
Um, hydrocarbons, there's hexane, liver, central nervous system, and benzene known to cause leukemia, if you didn't know that. So remember, I was just looking at triclopyr, and now I'm on to kerosene, and kerosene's got multiple chemicals, and triclopyr's got three different versions, and I'm getting further into the rabbit hole. And then I start looking up kerosene, pulmonary effects, neuroendocrine effects, cardiovascular system, on and on. I read more about kerosene. Basically, I come to the conclusion it's not good. And then there's the surfactant. There they go, needed. Yes, 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 yes. Here's one that they recommend surfactant for herbicides. I go to the fine print. Alkylphenol ethoxylate, alkylphenol, alkylphenol, that, that rings a bell. Can't quite remember that one, but I know that it's not good. So this is what kills me as students. You guys have access to so much information, it's not even funny, all right? I'll give you an easy thing you can do. Alkylphenol ethoxylate, I'm lazy, I copied and pasted that up there. And then just add the word to any chemical you wanna look about, toxicity. That's all you're gonna to need to do. Your chemical and the word toxicity, Google. An overview, perfect. That's what I need, an overview. Go to the overview. It degrades. It loses this ethoxy group and then it becomes an alkyl phenol. It's like, oh, that's why I've heard of these things. Those things are nasty. They're really potent, what we call endocrine disruptors. In males, Exposure of nonophenol and octophenol has been shown to cause testicular damage, de decreased testicular size, decreased sperm production, and so on and so on and so on. Remember, I started with triclopyr. So, you understand, and this is in some ways what the chemical companies love, right? They love the complexity. They, they rely on the complexity um, to make it as confusing as possible that they can for you. So another one, Mazapir, similar things. Here was a study that showed some problems with various internal organs, and then most of these effects were not considered significant by EPA. Yeah. Why? I don't know exactly. Um, but it seems like there could be something going on here. Again, the amine version of this, again, notice the commonality here with the irreversible eye damage. So there's been some spraying your eyes are irritated, that might make sense. Um, EPA, again, cancer, class E, non-carcinogen, basically. Um, but a bunch of studies that showed tumors in laboratory animals, a variety of tumors. EPA found that the frequency of thyroid and adrenal gland tumors in cancers did not increase above the levels found in other studies, but done by the same lab. So they called it class E. This herbicide in particular, uh, it's pretty potent on non-target plants, so if you've got a garden, stuff like that, it can be problematic. And it also breaks down, in, so it has a longer half-life, greater than a year, depending on the soil and stuff again. And it breaks down in stuff called quinolinic acid, which causes eye irritation, respiratory system, um, and skin irritation. It's also a neurotoxin, and it also can cause symptoms, basically, nervous system um, dysfunction, loss of coordination and trembling, things like that. So there's another herbicide that as it breaks down, you got another chemical you gotta track. You see the complexity of these things. So summing a little bit of this up, if you're gonna gather information on this stuff, I mean, obviously the first question, is this harming me? Wanna know that. <coughs> And I took 2,4-D and did what I said. Type the word toxicity next to it. And for you, two things you can find that are really friendly for the general public. Um, so Oregon State has these fact sheets on a lot of the chemicals that you're probably exposed to. And also Cornell University. So you see Cornell, you see Oregon State. If you click on those fact sheets, I can. I couldn't stick the whole fact sheet on there, but you know, they're trying to make it friendly for you. And you can read it and understand it and whether you should be worried about these things or not. This is the Oregon State one. It's not the whole sheet, of course. And then here's the one out of Cornell. Um, and it 
the Cornell one tends to give you a little more detail if you want detail um, and stuff like that. So that would be my one recommendation. Inform yourselves. Inform yourselves the best you can. And then, actually, it's the other question I thought about. So do we need to be spraying for us? I mean, yeah. Just in, in follow-up, um, this MOU process that environmental groups are involved in, background discovery on that is that in 2008, 800,000 pounds of chemicals, including 2,4-D, atrazine, and glyphosate were dumped on our forests. And the more disturbing fact is that 2008 was the last year amounts were required to be reported mm. to the state of Oregon. So, so in terms of exactly what you're saying, if there's a group that's going to ask the questions, it won't be the state of Oregon. Right. It will be us. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, the other thing is, is this necessary? I am not a forester. I've done permaculture and things, but I'm not a forester. But I started looking around, and I started reading some papers, and there's some studies out there that actually indicate that spraying herbicides doesn't make a Douglas fir tree any bigger than if you didn't spray them. And in fact, what I was finding, and I didn't spend a lot of time on this, but what little I found is it just depends what sort of invasives are in the area. So if you have like a, just a lot of weeds and whatnot, it really doesn't matter. If you got really big, thick kind of brush-like things that might compete with your Doug furs then. So the other way to arm yourself is like, hey, I just read all these papers. What do you guys think about this? It says that really spraying herbicides doesn't really help your bottom line much. So, you know, instead of, well, is this hurting me? Let's let's let's, stop. let's, let's not have to ask that question and, and think about the other end of it. Should you even be doing this to begin with? So it was interesting what I found just in a very short amount of time with a couple of studies looking at this. And again, I don't really know what I'm doing in this case. So, so there you go. There's your ecosystem. And um, you know, I think it's gonna pop up. Um, why would you destroy the systems that are keeping you alive? I don't get that. So um, it's providing all kinds of services, clean water, soil, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and this is the question to ask as human beings, of course, now, and a lot of the stuff that's going on. Um, you know, it should be looking like this, right? Really clear water and great forests that are really functional for you. So wrapping it up, should you be concerned? I think you know my answer to that. I'd be concerned. I mean, you know, I, you guys got me concerned enough. Like if I stayed in a hotel here, I'd be looking, I fill my glass at the tap, I'd be going, mm, honestly. So, but we're talking about mixtures. We don't know what's going on with mixtures. There's almost no research looking at mixtures because it's incredibly difficult to do, as you can see. Um, if you're not looking for it, you're not going to find it, both on the chemical and the health effect. If we're not looking for that health effect, then we don't know it's a problem. You know, your watershed is what's keeping you alive. And yeah, we find economics are more important than human well-being, unfortunately. Um, one thing we did when I was in Indiana that's useful is you form kind of these little mini groups of people that have some expertise. And when a problem arises, you get together and, and kind of bring these expertises together. So we had a group in Indiana when they were going to put a soybean plant in, and we had different people that were good at different things. And we said, you can't put that soybean plant in here because it's going to raise a ozone levels and you know the air pollution we're going to be you know we won't be under entertainment you know so we had a guy in fact he led the group he was a chemist had somebody who worked in a hospital i guess at that time i was the biologist toxicologist but we even had some people you know in your case i'd get somebody who knows something about forestry and you know somebody that knows something about policies and you know kind of form a working group. Um, we found this quite effective. One of the few times in my life we uh, made enough stink about the soybean processing plant in Indiana, uh, they decided to leave. You know, they said, "You guys are too much a pain in the ass. We're not going to put this thing in here." And so that was, felt kind of cool. Um, anyway, it's my recommendation to you. That's all I got to say.